review of regulatory trends impacting businesses at the state and local level, particularly those regulations impacting one of our largest industry, agriculture. I'm sure this panel will allow us to finish strong, just like Bad Gillis did this last year at Sperry Van Ness. Like the last panel, we'll collect your questions and share them with the panel. If you have a question, again, hold your card in the air. Our panel includes Earl F. Buddy Hans, Secretary of Agriculture for the State of Maryland, Kenny Bounds, Senior Vice President for Regional Lending at Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, and Matt Holloway, um, Wicomico County Council President and also uh, owner of a uh, farm here in uh, Wicomico County. This session is going to be panel, this panel will be moderated by Dr. James McNaughton, President and CEO of AH Pharma. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Uh, good, morning. good morning. Well, we appreciate the Chamber including agriculture uh, in this economic development uh, summit. It's uh, every meeting I go to, every chamber meeting I go to, every economic meeting I go to always involves a, a discussion of agriculture and uh, showing how important uh, it is for the area and uh, thanks again uh, for including us. We have great, uh, three great uh, people here to discuss regulatory trends. It's obvious to say that uh, regulating our businesses is not declining any. Uh, they're on the rise, uh, not only in Maryland, but uh, in other states. Uh, it's a critical issue. Uh, so these panelists are going to give us several ways they're going to reverse that trend this I year. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a hint, by the way. Uh, but uh, but we, we, we hope to have a lively discussion on this. Uh, I'll, I've asked each one to uh, make a short presentation to make sure they get their points out. Uh, I'll start with uh, Buddy Hans first. Well, thank you, James, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, based on what James says, maybe I should leave. Uh, but uh, just uh, for my three to five minutes, I just want to give you a little bit of background of where we are and, and why we are where we are with agriculture today and regulations. You know, prior to 1998, uh, the Maryland agriculture was probably uh, under-regulated, or that's not the right term either, but there were very few regulations on agriculture. Uh, there's some pesticide requirements for licensing and application and, and that kind of thing, but other than that, there were very few requirements or re regulations on our industry. Uh, but that all changed in 1998 uh, because of the uh, Fisteria event that happened pretty close to here. And uh, the passage of the 1998 Water Quality Improvement Act required that all farmers in the state have a nutrient management plan which for those of you who don't know, in very basic terms, is just a recipe on how a farmer grows his crop. And uh, prior to that, there was a voluntary nutrient management plan at the Department of Agriculture, and we had about 85 or 90 percent of the farmers in the state already reporting that they were following some type of nutrient management plan. So uh, the regulation basically required everyone to do that, that had a gross of over $2,500, and require those producers that were already following some sort of a nutrient management plan, some reporting and recording uh, new guidelines that they had to follow, and then put a burden upon the state to ensure that those producers were following those guidelines. So it created an enforcement issue for the state, as does any regulation. So uh, after that, up until about 2007 or 8, there really wasn't a lot of change to the program. We went through a phased-in approach. Uh, the program was implemented. Farmers got accustomed to the reporting and having a nutrient management plan and those requirements for, that were necessary. Uh, but all that changed in about 2007 and 2008 when some environmental organizations sued EPA over the lack of enforcement of water quality improvement in the Chesapeake Bay. And that decision rendered by a judge said, agreed with those environmental organizations and said the EPA had not done an adequate job of holding the Chesapeake Bay watershed states to water quality improvement. Uh, there had been several Bay agreements, but nobody had actually met their goals set out forth in those agreements, and uh, the environmental organizations did not believe progress was being made, and the judge agreed with them. Hence the uh, TMDL that was established for the Chesapeake Bay. There was a presidential executive order requiring that the Chesapeake Bay meet its goals. All the Chesapeake Bay watershed states 
were assigned loads into the Chesapeake Bay and were asked to reduce those loads by 2025, which most of you in local government clearly recognize and understand. So uh, we developed a plan for agriculture. We are now measured every two years. The previous agreements, there really was no measurement, interim measurements. Uh, they were set some goals over a period of time. Nobody really checked in the interim, and then all of a sudden the deadline was here, and uh, oops, we haven't done it. Uh, there was just too many oopses. And uh, henceforth, this lawsuit that created this new situation that we're in. So in Maryland, we created our WIP, our Watershed Implementation Plan, that a lot of you were probably involved in here on the Lower Eastern Shore. And the agricultural community um, had to provide their own plan of how we meet those new goals. So uh, our plan required that. And I do want to say while I have an opportunity that uh, you know, we have the best farmers anywhere in this country. I will match the conservation work that our farmers have done for decades voluntarily up against any state in the country. Uh, if you look back over the history of our farmers and the amount of conservation practices they've installed since the 50s, uh, I don't think there's any state out there that compares. Uh, that, that's a really good thing. That, that the, the downside of that is we had done so much voluntary work that EPA was concerned about any plan that we put forward that had a voluntary component. They felt like uh, to reach our goals, we had done as much as we could do through voluntary practices and that there were they needed a stronger plan moving forward with more strict enforcement and requirements. So we developed a plan uh, to meet the load, which uh, is just a matter of practices that have efficiencies that at the end of the day add up to a total that meets your goal. So uh, about 18 months ago or two years ago, uh, we made some changes to the nutrient management plan, updated those uh, planning requirements based on current research. Uh, and then this, we're currently right now in a process to institute some more regulations on how we manage phosphorus in those nutrient management plans. So uh, in our WIP, we were required to hit certain milestones, uh, and I am happy to report that in our previous two milestones, agriculture has exceeded its goal. A lot of that is because of the outstanding work our farmers have done uh, applying and planting cover crops. Uh, but there is a the agriculture community is concerned about why we're instituting more regulations when we've overachieved our goals. The, uh, the issue with that is that there's, there's a, a limit to the amount of cover crops in the state that we can plant in a given year, and we believe we are uh, at about the maximum amount of cover crops that we can plant in this state in the time that need to be planted. So moving forward, our goal, as our goal goes up, to fill that gap, it's going to require uh, more more practices across all of our farms, hence the need for the regulations. Uh, I would like to say in my forecast that uh, I don't see any more regulations coming, and I can tell you that as of today, uh, the WIP that was accepted by EPA that Maryland is following, based on the progress that we made and the things we have in place, I'm very confident that we're on a plan that agriculture will meet its goals in 2025 if nothing changes. However, in 2017, there'll be a recalibration of the model, and nobody can guarantee what that recalibration will look like. So if the ag loads uh, don't go increase, I think we're in very good shape to meet our goals by 2025. But if, if, there, if there is a moderation in those model goals and our load increases, then uh, our current plan may not meet those, depending on what they are. So uh, I think that when we look at uh, where we are today, I think, as far as agriculture goes, I think we're in pretty good shape. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Uh, I hope PAC-14 got, um, got that quote a few minutes ago, uh, that there's uh, very few, if any, I'm paraphrasing there, uh, of regulations coming along. Uh, just joking, buddy, buddy really. Uh, but we hope so. Uh, Next, I'll uh, ask Kenny Bounds. Uh, Kenny has been a dogmatic supporter of the poultry industry, as we all know, uh, and, and um, he's uh, held many positions uh, on the shore in that area, and, and certainly in, in his job. And, and uh, we appreciate him coming today, and I'll ask him to, for comments now. Thanks, James. And, and Buddy, he told me 10 minutes I could have to open, so I don't know if he, he wanted me to, uh, you know, go back and back. You got all the rest. <laughs> um, 
Thank you very much. Thanks to the chamber for uh, uh, recognizing uh, agriculture as an important piece of our local economy. Uh, it certainly is uh, for uh, Farm Credit, uh, the company that I work for, and for all of us in this room. Um, it's a huge part of our local economy. At the Maryland Farm Bureau Convention this past December, uh, Blair Lee, who's a columnist uh, many of you probably know and read uh, for the Gazette, declared, war has been declared on rural Maryland. And indeed, it seems so uh, to us many times from a regulatory standpoint. Maryland citizens struggle to have a voice, and rural citizens struggle to have a voice in policy, regulation, legislation in the state, and sometimes even within those agencies uh, that represent our own interests. Thank goodness for a strong Eastern Shore delegation and supportive local elected officials, many of those in this room today, uh, many of those in Annapolis uh, doing their jobs as they're, they're in session today. While we don't always agree on issues, uh, it's been my experience that our Eastern Shore delegation, our local elected folks, we certainly know how to come together to represent our local interests, and I think we can be proud of that. But it's increasingly uh, more difficult to have a voice uh, in Annapolis. Secretary Hant shared a few minutes ago before we came up to the podium that someone who's not been known in the agriculture community who will remain unnamed um, uh, as a friend of agriculture necessarily has got a pretty uh, uh, pro-agriculture bill he's going to introduce. So that's a good thing. Maybe, maybe that's a harbinger of, uh, of things to come. The, uh, the phosphorus management tool, uh, I'm going to mention that specifically because, and, and I know Secretary Hans is probably tired of hearing about phosphorus management tool. Um, but it's an example, I think, of a dangerous way that regulations could proceed in the future uh, and affect us. And I'm, and I'm worried about it. I'm worried about how it can affect all of our businesses, for me particularly, for agriculture, for young farmers succeeding their parents coming on the farms, those sorts of things. Regulations that would have a serious impact on our community move forward much too fast with no economic impact study being done and the science admittedly by the scientists doing the work incomplete. And that's a scary thing to me. Uh, you move forward with no economic impact, no measure, and the science not done. They were being promulgated by the governor's office, of course, through the Department of Ag um, as regulations. and. It bothers me that I think they were influenced by some of the more radical environmental groups that are in Maryland. Uh, we certainly have, and all of us in our businesses, have a range of, of spokespersons and people from those that are pretty reasonable to those, those that aren't. And our experience in the past has been when we had issues, like coming out of 1998 uh, and Fisteria, um, it wasn't Fisteria, by the way, that caused the lesions. I hope everybody remembers that. I always like to say that. Um, but, um, you know, we did sit down with environmental groups in those subsequent years, and we made great progress. Uh, as Buddy said, we're, we're, we're meeting our goal. I think we're at 130 percent of the goal right now for agriculture. Um, and, and that's really good. It's something to be proud of. But what bothers me is what happens to us as a result of that. We very often don't get credit. We get criticized. And often the urban press holds agriculture up as the main source of pollution and the only source of pollution to Chesapeake Bay. And it just seems unfair. And then when regulations are promulgated that aren't based in science, that have political fingerprints all over them, it makes it unsavory. Um, you know, if we had done this thing right, in fact, we were on campus here. I was thinking about the Citizens Blue Ribbon Fisteria Action Commission. Uh, that was, that was uh, pulled together to talk about phosphorus. And I believe the meeting was on campus here in 97, probably, uh, to get ready for the session in 98. But if there had been adequate funding at the time for research and a commitment for everybody to sit down and let's really figure this thing out. Still today, this phosphorus management tool does not tell us how many molecules of phosphorus are leaving the field. It's not that. And if I was an environmentalist, I would want to know, what's it really doing? Now, there's a lot of good work being done on campus here at the University of Maryland and others looking at ways to remediate phosphorus. But folks, it's going to take decades to, to move the needle on phosphorus. There was a USGS study out recently on nitrogen that said the same thing. And I was surprised with that. I thought nitrogen was much more um, uh, moving through the soil profile and the water much more quickly than what it, what it really is. So, doesn't mean you don't start today, but you do it 
with patience and the right science and the right commitment uh, to do it right. So I hope that moving forward, this time, instead of what we did in 98, we can, we can do it right. I've got a quote here from a scientist consulting with the poultry uh, industry. And this is how he summarized how, uh, and he lives close by, and I won't name him, but uh, summarized how Maryland uh, approached the phosphorus management tool. With the PMT, Maryland is a member of a multi-state coalition that is developing a uniform phosphorus plan for the Bay Watershed, elected to act on its own prior to any agreed upon recommendations from the multi-state organization. It appears that these proposed phosphorus regulations are driven by political science at the highest level of Maryland state government, not by data-driven science. And of course, you know, I, I agree with that. I also agree with sometimes you have to act before all the science is done. You could, you could research the rest of eternity and not get all of the answers. Although here in some of the, uh, the IT panel prior to, I think maybe uh, we've, we've gone pretty far already. In November, Secretary Hance received a letter from Chairman Norm Conaway, Senator Mathias, Wicomico County Executive Rick Pollitt, Worcester County Commissioner Shockley, and numerous other individuals uh, and organizations. Part of it said, we appreciate the opportunity to offer a science-based, common-sense proposal that does not seek to roll back any environmental programs now in place. Instead, we offer a plan that we believe will help implement the new PMT in an orderly, economically stable, and science-based process. We believe it's better upfront to create a well-thought-out new system of farming rather than later trying to correct mistakes made in a rush to meet an artificial deadline set by the U U.S. Environmental uh, Protection Agency. Farm Credit signed that letter. Uh, we calculated that we had close to three quarters of a billion dollars of loans at risk with this phosphorus management tool. And that's why we've been active legislatively uh, over the years advocating um, for agriculture. And I'll give a few more examples of things that I'm a little bit worried about, a lot worried about right now, of where I think regulatory uh, efforts have gone and legislation have gone the wrong way. We haven't seen this bill yet, I don't think, buddy, uh, but the Poultry Fair Share Act by Delegate Shane Robinson in Montgomery County is kicking around. That thing would add a five cent tax to every chicken uh, that's sold. And you know, you think about that, you think, oh yeah, they can pass along the cost to the consumer, that's nothing. Folks, that's not what happens. You can't pass along those costs. We've calculated that's gonna be about a 20% reduction for our poultry grower income. And grand total, it's gonna take about $15 million out of the Delmarva economy for the poultry industry if that thing passes. The septic bill. Um, and accounting for growth. You know, the septic bill, um, I, I know our counties have done a nice job working on the tier maps. Um, uh, Rick, I know you pulled together a group because I was part of that group in Wicomico County to try to find uh, consensus. But I'll tell you, this down zoning uh, with the septic bill, I still believe is the greatest grab of private property rights that I've seen in my lifetime. Uh, it is, it's extraordinary. And it's something you're having to work through, we're all working through, and I surely hope that I'm wrong in the end and that the market recovers uh, and with, f with uh, fewer available building sites over time that uh, we'll recover those property values. But uh, that's, that's been a scary thing, and that's a transfer of power from the counties to the state. And I happen to think that that's probably the wrong direction. Uh, I mentioned accounting for growth. Um, I, and I'm gonna just, sort of summarized with two things here. One example of how the federal government has uh, done some things where they should have done differently, in my opinion. One of those was when they came out with concentrated animal feeding operation standards a few years ago. They issued a standard for new house construction, and that affected all of the building on Delmarva. And I called my friend at EPA Region 3, who's now retired, and I said, what do we have to do to comply with your new rule that you just put out for new house construction? You know what he said? We have no standards and we probably won't for several years. So I'm like, well, what should we do? Not finance, finance poultry houses moving forward? I mean, we want to comply with the standards. So we ended up pulling together a local task force and helping create some standards that they did adopt. 
which was good, but they put the regulation out without any thought or standard whatsoever in place prior to. One thing that bothers me, and I want to end, end with this, is, again, where I started, the tone of some of these environmental groups, the water keepers and others that want to litigate without coming to the table to seek solutions. I think that's a dangerous thing. Uh, and for the University of Maryland uh, Law Clinic to have gotten involved in that uh, was not a good thing. They tried to make amends with that. They're now going to be working with agriculture some. But there's, there's several new groups that most of us have never heard of. One of those, the Chesapeake Legal Alliance, is a group of attorneys. And I want to read from their webpage what their mission is. CLA seeks to level the playing field by finding lawyers who will assist citizens and organizations pro bono in participating in government decision-making processes and enforcing underutilized laws and regulations. CLA's goal is to effect change in compliance and enforcement. So again, I don't want to be negative, but I, I, I hope that's not where we're headed. I hope we come back to reasonableness and come to the table and find ways to uh, get solutions, uh, science-based, economically sound, uh, to move forward. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, next, we're, we're very happy to have a local official to uh, address some of these issues. Uh, what Comico County has been dealing with is, uh, with the regulatory trends, and the Chamber in particular has been focused on this uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, I'll ask uh, Matt Holloway to uh, address uh, his comments, but also maybe to have a comment on the septic bill and the uh, tear map. Issue. Sure. And Kenny, I think while I was in the hallway, you must have uh, copied some of my notes here. So uh, I, I was looking over your shoulder. <laughs> uh, the water appropriation permits, pesticide reporting regulations, nutrient management plans, phosphorus management tool, critical area laws, soil and erosion control, stormwater management, total maximum daily loads, watershed improvement plans, the septic bill, accounting for growth. These are not all bad laws and regulations and began with mostly good intentions, but certainly they are burdensome on the economy of the of economy at large. As a member of the legislative branch of Wicomico County, I believe one of my responsibilities is to create an environment favorable to, to, to conducting business, all types of business. Yet with the amount of regulations flowing downhill from federal and state agencies, my job is increasingly difficult. Now, I've never been one to stand by and say, hell no, we won't go, but I am more of a critical thinking problem solver. Uh, fortunately, there are many like me. Uh, one example is I was honored to be asked to participate in a work group uh, on the phosphorus management tool. As Kenny mentioned, uh, this work group was formed by Norm Conway and had representatives from all aspects of agriculture and local government. Uh, DPI was there, Farm Bureau, uh, Rick Pollitt, Jim Mathias, Rich Colburn, uh, Worcester and Somerset County elected officials. Uh, I felt it was a great collaborative effort. Uh, we came up with a recommendation to Secretary Hance and to the governor on how the PMT should be implemented and requested further studies, including an economic impact study. Uh, this, like I say, was a great example of collaboration, but it really should not have been necessary. Uh, I'm proud of our ag industry and heritage and I think that Maryland should be doing all it can to protect it. Um, I was requested to talk about the uh, tier map, the septic bill, and the PMT. Um, the tier map, Wicomico County, uh, as a council, we wrestled with the tier map for many months. Um, fortunately, Rick Pollitt came up with a concept of a roundtable discussion that was actually hosted by the Bosterman Center for Conflict Resolution. Um, this roundtable was attended by many invested citizens in our community. Uh, environmentalists, farmers, property owners, lenders, Kenny Bounds was there, uh, elected officials. Um, polar opposites when we came to the table, really. Um, but after two nights, I felt we came away with an excellent suggestion as to a path forward for our county. Um, and today, I'm proud to say we are following with that path. Um, by March, I hope to have a map in hand that will not only have the council support, but that of both branches of our, of our government. Uh, I think this was an excellent model 
that we used uh, that focused on collaboration and resulted in buy-in by the parties uh, who originally had polarized views. I'm hoping this process can be used again with reference to the Clean Chesapeake Coalition, um, our WIP, and how we address Bay Health. The phosphorus management tool, um, there's a few reasons for the opposition um, that you've heard from the agricultural community to the phosphorus management tool. Um, Kenny went over most of them. Um, of course, it's the potential impact on the poultry industry, both the growers and the processors. But another one is the biological impact or the agronomy impact, and that's something that I uh, fortunately was schooled in at Virginia Tech. Uh, phosphorus is a necessary nutrient for plant growth. Um, it's required when I plant my sod in the field for initial root development, uh, which is critical to make sure that I can get my crop out of the ground in a timely manner. Um, even soils with high phosphorus values here on the eastern shore, which, have, which is due to the high levels of aluminum which binds the phosphorus in the soil colloid, does not mean that that phosphorus is available to the plant for uptake as a nutrient. Um, the phosphorus that we have here, even, even the ones that are extremely high levels, does not reflect what's available to the plant. Um, I did see yesterday, I received notification of MDA's request for proposal for techniques and technology to improve the management and utilization of manure and other rag, ag resources. Excellent idea. I'm fully in support of this. But I suggest that it should have been done well before an attempt to, uh, to force a phosphorus management tool. Um, because of my history with the sod farm and history with uh, the um, degree that I have, I know of several options that are, uh, could be used to, to handle phosphorus. Um, one of them is humic acid. And, and as soon as I saw this request for proposal by MDA, uh, I contacted uh, one of our fertilizer companies that we use. Um, they've done years of research on humic acid. Humic acid can be added um, not only to the manure to turn it into a slow-release phosphorus source, but can also be added to the soil to free up some of the bound phosphorus on the soil colloid to make it more available to the plant. Um, I think that really and my suggestion to the state would be that instead of a complete ban on phosphorus in these high phosphorus soils, um, the state should be looking to allow, I, I believe they should allow slow-release phosphorus to be used on these soils, uh, potentially to use humic treated manure as a slow release uh, phosphorus source, or at least, in the very least, allow the application of the plant usage level of phosphorus so that these plants can have the biologically required amount of phosphorus for proper growth. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That's some uh, great points and uh, well presented. Uh, I would like to mention that the Wacomico County, uh, some of the Wacomico County officials met with uh, Secretary Hans uh, this last week. Uh, Rick and Wayne were there and others. And, and really, uh, Secretary Hans is, is, is really working with us close on a very important uh, environmental project for the future. Uh, and uh, it's been in the paper the last week or so, or so but uh, we appreciate that, uh, that support. And, uh, and look forward to working with you on the project. It's, it's extremely important for Wacomico County, and we uh, look forward to uh, working with you on that, on that project. I'll come back around to Secretary Hance for rebuttal, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I didn't know this was a PMT discussion. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, the, the PMT has been a topic of discussion in the ag community for about the past 12 months. Actually. Uh, Last year, right about now, we were in the process to adopt the PMT. And uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, actually had it all approved and ready to go uh, July the 1st until the University of Maryland made a, a technical correction in the guidance document, which is the basis for the PMT. And so we had to go back through the AELR process. And um, I was actually surprised at the, the amount of uh, lack of comments we got during the process we held last January and February, to be honest. Uh, but they made up for that in the summer and in the fall. And so uh, in our attempts to um, 
work with the community on the PMT and moving forward, you know, we held some outreach meetings. We had uh, three public outreach meetings, one here in Salisbury, one up in Salisbury. We had about 800 people attend those meetings and uh, nobody that came was very happy. And then we received about 700 letters. And uh, in the first process, which we were in this time last year, we received eight letters, uh, mostly from the agricultural organizations. And we also, of course, received letters from the environmental community with their concerns. Um, so anyway, we are uh, tried to work with the community, the agriculture community, this past year. We're still trying to work with the community. We, we certainly realize the physical impact. Uh, anytime you ask a farmer to change the way he operates his business, there certainly is uh, discontent. And then when that change in his operation also reflects a physical impact, he of course is uh, immediately more uh, imp and more angry and so uh, you know as as I was earlier I was trying to be brief he told me three to five minutes Kenny so apparently he wanted you to talk more than me um, you know the TMDL requires in our whip we, we were required to implement the PMT once the University of Maryland completed uh, produced a guidance document as Kenny said you know research goes on forever but at certain points in the research, they reach certain conclusions. And when the university produces a guidance document, that means they've reached certain conclusions. And the conclusion that was reached that triggered the PMT was that once soil levels uh, are above 150 FIV, uh, a crop has adequate phosphorus in the soils. You don't need to apply any additional phosphorus, which from the environmental community and those not closely related to agriculture so what's the big deal you know science says and and honestly uh, I farm on the western shore and uh, where I have soils with high P I don't apply any P I, I see that as an economic benefit that that's that P is already in that soil and I don't need to buy that P um, the, but the, the the complication that the PMT has triggered is that for those livestock producers that have manure to deal with uh, that manure contains a certain amount of phosphorus and so hence they've been using that as their nutrient source and if we ban phosphorus they can't use manure now they're going to have to buy those nutrients that they previously were getting from their manure and it creates an issue for those poultry producers that don't farm and only grow poultry uh, the relationships that they the historical relationships that they have had to dispose of their manure now are going to be disrupted because those individuals may not be able to use manure because of the phosphorus levels in their soils so uh, what I do like to say to every those outside of the eastern shore we don't have a surplus litter problem you'll hear that a lot in Annapolis and on my side of the bay uh, that we have too much manure, that farmers just dump it in the bay because there's just too much. That's not true. We, we don't have an excess manure problem. What we have is a distribution problem where by no fault of the farmers, they've followed research over the years, and I think Kenny will agree with me at least on one thing. Uh, that research has changed over the years, and our farmers down here on the lower shore as recently as probably 10 or 15 years ago were applying 8 to 10 tons to the acre because that's what the research said. And then uh, research said, well, you don't need eight or 10 tons, you only need three to five. And now, actually, the plans we write today only call for two to three. Uh, so research has been keeping up. It's just this most recent research has, has uh, created this disruption to the system. So uh, I will say, as, as in this administration, um, you know, we certainly have imposed new regulations because of the TMT, TMDL, but in every case, uh, we have tried to mitigate the physical impact as best we can. We cannot mitigate all those physical impacts, but through cost share programs, and the governor's been very good about providing resources. I would hence to say this governor's probably provided more physical and technical resources to agriculture than any governor's administration in the history of the state. Uh, we've spent last year about 27 or $28 million just in cost share practices to farmers. And the governor's committed in the PMT to help address those, some of those physical concerns. Uh, there are certainly uh, some physical concerns that uh, may not be attainable, but trying to at least protect those that most impact the growers themselves as best that we can. So uh, we have tried to be uh, open to any comments or suggestions by stakeholders. Uh, I've been all over this state 
talk to everybody, uh, but we are being held. Every time we, we withdrew those uh, PMT regulations twice, we're in the third drafting now. Every time we withdraw them, I get a call from EPA. What are you doing? And, um, you know, it's the old 80-20 rule. When I'm down here, 80% of the people I see are very mad about the PMT. When I'm on the western side of the bay, 80% are mad because we haven't done it already. And in Maryland, if you look at the demographics, uh, I don't know that it's a war on rural Maryland, but uh, from the perspective, I can certainly see how rural Maryland sees significant impacts because of what's going on. But when you look at the legislature and the makeup of the legislature, I think we have one farmer left in the legislature. Uh, you know, and the legislature is controlled by suburban Maryland. Um, it's, it's an uphill challenge, you know, and the, the governor has to look out for the best interests of all citizens, so he takes comments from everybody. I think there's one environmental organization in the state claims 100,000 members. We only have about 10,000 or 12,000 farmers in the whole state, and one organization is claiming more mem 10, you know, eight times more members than we have farmers. So in Maryland, it is a significant force, and uh, so we can't just discount their comments and concerns, but we do try to take into consideration those impacts. So. I will say that uh, every time, not most times, <coughs> every time that uh, we've asked Secretary Hans to uh, address this issue, he has done so and done so professionally, and, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, I'll open this up for questions. Uh, Ernie will be coming around and uh, getting your, your cards and your questions, but I'll start this out uh, with uh, one for Kenny Bounds. Uh, DPI, Farm Bureau, and even Farm Credit have worked extensively over the years, uh, over the last five years with environmentalists. Has this been fruitful? And I'll have a follow-up question there. If not, uh, is it uh, time for agriculturalists to stand up and uh, fight uh, this uh, to even a greater extent than they've already done? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, it has been fruitful. I mean, there's a lot of times where we have uh, sat down and, and uh, Secretary Hans was part of that as well in his previous role with Maryland Farm Bureau uh, with, uh, with environmental groups. And we have tackled some tough issues. We have rolled the sleeves up. We have not always agreed, but I think we've found consensus a lot of times. Um, and, and that's a good thing. I do sometimes look back and wonder, though, if we've handled that correctly. Would we have been better to have dug trenches deep and fought the battle the entire time? And I, only, and, and I don't personally believe that, but I, I'm starting to question myself just based on where we are because of the, these other groups that are coming at us, the water keepers, the other groups that I mentioned, who now want to litigate. They're not giving us credit for what we've done. Uh, and agriculturalists are being cast as the bad guys not always, but, but more often than should be. And, you know, the people get tired of hearing this, but it's true. We're going to 9 billion people on the planet in the not too distant future. We need to feed people and we need to do it in an environmentally friendly way. And there is, you don't have to make a choice there when, when you know, one analogy to make is going back to in 1998 when Governor Glenn Denning chose the method he did for dealing with uh, what he thought was Fisteria, and the way that Tom Carper, then governor of Delaware, handled it was completely different. Uh, Tom Carper called everybody into the room. I was in that room, closed the door, and said, you're not leaving until we figure this out. And that was quite a different approach. Uh, and that set the tone for Delaware. It's still the same today. I know, buddy, you get tired of hearing that about Delaware. Uh, not to say that we haven't worked together in Maryland as well, but some of these other groups have come in now and the litigation piece uh, is pretty threatening and uh, uh, buddy mentioned the uh, uh, the tmdl for the bay you know that thing a, a lot of groups now they'll come and they'll file a suit in a friendly court and they'll settle out of court uh, and and thereby effectively legislate through the court uh, without people having a voice and a say in what's being done so they know where they're going to file the suit. They file it. Um, they settle out of court, and, and then we have to live with the results. 
And that type of thing, or just outright litigation like we had against the Hudson family, uh, it's hard for a farm family to defend itself. It's hard for a company like Purdue to spend the millions of dollars they did on legal fees to defend themselves. So, uh, James, I don't know. I've given you a mixed answer, I'm afraid. Um, let me clarify one thing, too, while I'm here. I, I get uh, passionate about issues and the land use issue. I, I just want to clarify. Farm Credit's on record many times talking about their position on downzoning and the effect on property values. The other comments that I made were my own personal comments, not those of Farm Credit. Sometimes when you wear a lot of hats, you have to clarify. So um, I just wanted to clarify that for the group. And as a follow-up to that, Matt, uh, could you uh, further address uh, the uh, tier map and as it relates particularly to, agri uh, to agriculture? Sure. Uh, the tier map is one is originally, but let's see, this, let's back up a little bit. Back in 2009, um, I, I was, that was originally when I got interested in politics, actually. Uh, that's when the uh, land dispute issues really came to a head here in Wicomico County. There was an effort by the council to downzone the A1 district. Um, I was involved in um, the organization that actually had the tractor cade uh, outside of the government office building um, to try to you know, stop that from happening. We were successful. Um, we felt that uh, that was a potential, uh, had a huge potential impact on the ag community uh, based off the assessed value of the land. Um, fast forward to two years ago, uh, the septic bill gets passed and uh, here the state is telling us to do exactly what we had just won the fight against doing on a local level. Um, so. I guess uh, my answer to that, as I said before, instead of standing there and saying that I wouldn't do it, um, the, the best answer is always to work together, try to come up with the, uh, the best response and to make, make lemonade out of lemons. So we, um, we worked together, came up with an approach to the tier map that I feel um, the end result will maintain the equity for the landowners who are concerned about loss of equity, yet it protects um, a large portion of the A1 district um, by restricting development in those where uh, those lands that were already restricted due to soils, uh, were already restricted due to uh, conservation easements, and uh, the people who were not as, a, as concerned about the uh, loss of equity on their properties. Um, I think what we'll see is a, a map that comes forward that has buy-in from those concerned uh, citizens. Thank you, Matt. I want to make sure my buddy doesn't understands that this is not my question. <laughs> uh, but I thought it was a, I thought it was a good question. This must be a singer. <laughs> but he likes it. <laughs> I need to work with with uh, Secretary Hans. So uh, the uh, Maryland has numerous uh, concentrating animal feeding operations on the western shore, and I'm quoting here. They're called cities. <laughs> Will Maryland hold urban areas uh, to the same uh, nutrient standard output uh, limits and ratios per household as it holds for farming operations? Well, the, the TMDL does require that every sector do its part. So, uh, you know, as Matt talked about the tier maps and the septic bill, all, that's, all that is interconnected to the TMDL. And uh, last year we did pass an urban lawn fertilizer bill so that homeowners uh, would control the amount of nutrients they put on their lawns. Here's an interesting fact that I like to tell everybody that I don't think they understand. In Maryland, we have one million acres of managed turf. We have 1.2 million acres of cultivated crops. So in this state, we have almost as much grass that's managed as we do cropland. So <clears throat> for those in the, the urban areas that don't think they're impacting, that's an interesting statistic for them. And in fact, two years ago, in a fertilizer reporting, in a fertilizer report in Maryland, for the first time, lawn fertilizer equaled agricultural fertilizer in Maryland. So it is significant. So we have taken steps to make sure that our urban neighbors are taking steps to reduce the amount of nutrients that they apply. 
Uh, in Maryland, we're on track by 2017 to have all the uh, major sewage treatment plants using the highest, um, can't even think what it's called right now, the alphabet is soup. Uh, but anyway, to have all of our major sewage treatment plants updated to the highest and best technology available, and then they'll start working on the miners. Uh, we read in the paper all the time about the overflows and those kinds of things. They are always going to happen, but at least we're taking steps to make sure that they're doing the best that they can. So I would say that uh, everybody's going to be held to a standard. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, ask this last question to uh, Kenny Bounds. Uh, I guess to emphasize the point that um, that ag agriculture groups and the poultry industry uh, is not, uh, I guess, uh, restricted to regulations per se, but uh, it's it's a trend that's a, a growing troublesome trend that's uh, toward a non-profitable business picture. We we have to understand that growers are independent businesses, and it's. Uh, it's important to them that they not be overregulated, be fair, but not be overregulated. What's your comment there? Well, certainly there's a cost to compliance. Everybody in here knows about that in their own, own individual businesses with whatever um, uh, regulation there is. You know, um, consumer protection stuff at Farm Credit, I just inundated the staff with a whole new round of, of stuff coming from Frank Dodd. and. Um, so there's a, there's a heavy cost to compliance for all businesses. Agriculture is not exempt. Um, you know, if you go back, and, and, and Buddy's right, the state has been and the federal government have really cost shared a lot of these, and kudos to the state of Maryland for their investment in that. That's been, uh, that's been wonderful and appreciated, and I think the environment and the farmers have benefited from that. But there's a lot of things um, uh, that farmers have to carry on their income statement still uh, that, that affects them. Um, I hate to keep using this as an example, but, but I will because it's top of mind. The phosphorus management tool, if we, we use poultry litter on our grain operation, and I know what it's worth, I've looked at the science uh, and looking at the value of, of not only the primary elements, but the secondary ones as well, and it's very significant. I mean, it's over $100 a ton, the value, uh, fertilizer value for that litter. And here's the kicker, though. The same guy that did work that enabled us to know that outside storage of poultry litter is not an environmental problem did work at the University of Delaware Research Station near Georgetown. And he was able to use uh, two and three tons of poultry litter per acre there and, and with a good crop removal rate, so the value of irrigation, make sure that you take it off, 150 bushels of corn, 200. He was able to still use poultry litter in that rotation at the rate you mentioned earlier and still drop phosphorus levels. So I think, I think Matt, you know, some of the work at Tech and at Maryland and other places, Delaware, uh, there's still a lot of that to be incorporated into this. Um, one final thing on that that, um, you know, that, that is disconcerting uh, in a way, and this is not exactly related to your question, James, but people should know that our futures are being dictated by the, by the modelers with the Chesapeake Bay. And that EPA model has got so many errors in it. I, I was going to all kinds of meetings there for a while, and I was part of that group. I had to stop going. My blood pressure couldn't take it anymore because I was holding my hand up every other statement saying, you know that's not really how that happens in the field, right? Um, so. In this particular case, the nutrient content and volume of poultry litter in that model, and Buddy, you'll have to correct me. I've gotten so mad about it, I've forgotten the numbers. It's something like 500% too high or something. It's something just crazy high. So we're hoping by 2017, as Secretary Hans mentioned earlier, when we recalibrate that model, we're hopeful that they'll make those corrections and really give us our proper share of that load. If they don't, James, I think the answer is we're going to be taking more money out of cash flow to comply. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Uh, they did a great job. Let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> and thanks to the audience.